Psalm 37 tonight. Psalm 37, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that we have your word. We have your truth. And it's been revealed to us, uh, the revelation of Jesus uh, to us in this world, your son, the Messiah. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that revealed that to us so that we would have life. And in him we would have eternal life as well. So Lord, we ask you that by his spirit, we'll be able to understand your word, apply it to our lives. Uh, Lord, we ask you, believing that you will do in us something new today, that we came uh, different than we came last week, and we will leave different than when we left last week. And so we pray that you would have mercy on us, and you would shine a light into our hearts through your word, and we'll be able to become more like you and be your disciple, Lord. Please teach us through this psalm such a appropriate psalm in the midst of what's going on in our world. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you for, uh, Lord, not only the, the fact that we can film and we can broadcast a video. Thank you for those who, uh, Lord, who are making it possible. Thank you for those who watch. Thank you for those who listen. And thank you, Lord God, that you are here in the midst of us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The temptations of a godly man. The temptations of a godly man. In fact, uh, many people would automatically say, well, godly men don't have temptations, right? They're godly. Well, if you read the Bible enough, you'll figure out that the temptations of a godly man are numerous and vast. In fact, the most godly man went through his own temptation, the Lord Jesus, in the wilderness. But what is the temptation of a godly man? Is it what we think it is? Is it some kind of immoral sin behavior that happens? You'll be surprised. The psalmist doesn't mention that. In fact, the whole book of Psalm, it's really an encouragement for us to praise God and to see the life of men and the life of women in the Old Testament and how they dealt with difficult times and difficult things. And the book of Psalm, of course, is no stranger to affliction and hardships and how to deal with it. In fact, uh, there's a Jewish parable. It's not a biblical parable per se, but it is, reflects the Bible. Uh, but it's not in the Bible, but it's a parable in which uh, the Jews looked at the Old Testament in, in three different ways. So you have the Torah, you have the writings, and you have the prophets. And they liken the Torah as the words of a king, as the words of a king who gives an edict. And people listen to the words of a king, and they understand that these are commands of a king. And they say, that's like Torah. It's God, his rules, his commands, his word goes out, and we listen. And it says, but it's hard to relate to a king, because we're peasants, and we're part of the kingdom, but it's hard to relate to a king. And so the king sent out messengers, and his messenger, one of his messenger was the prince. And they spoke on behalf of the king, and the Jews says, that's oh, so like the prophets. The prophets were men of God who came to us and delivered what the king meant. But it was hard to relate to princesses and messengers because they were royalty, and they were part of the kingdom, and we were all peasants, this Jewish parable says. And so the king sent out other messengers. And these messengers were part of the kingdom as well. And they sat with the people. And they talked with the people. And they hugged the people. And they encouraged the people to follow the king. And they said, those are like the writings. Like Job. Like Psalms. Like Proverbs. Who are not edicts per se. Thou shalt not do this. And thou shalt not do that. And they're not prophets, to a, to a degree there are prophecies in Psalms, but they deal mainly with the heart of man, the issues of man, the hardships of man, the trials of man. Have you ever sat in Red Job and just wept with him because of maybe the trials of your life? You ever sat through Proverbs and wondered, how did these men get through some of these difficult things? Or even David in a cave writing, oh Lord, don't forsake me. We can identify with the writings, with the Psalms and the Ecclesiastes. And, the, and, and Sergio was here teaching us a few weeks ago about Ecclesiastes because they're so human. They appeal to the heart of a man and woman to know that in conflicts and difficulties, God is still with us and he's going to make a way. So Psalms, or Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or, or even Lamentations are hit at the soul. And they just don't necessarily hit the mind in a sense of intellectual things, but they hit at the heart as well, the heart of a man, what to do in difficult times. And of course, Jesus talked about Psalms quite a bit. 
we've gone through this many, many times, but in the last chapter in Luke, he says that the Psalms speak directly of him, his life, his death, his suffering, and his resurrection, and his coming into glory. And he says the psalm speaks of that. So in the psalms, we look at the life of Jesus as well. So we're always captive to where our Lord appears in the psalms. And we've gone through many psalms already through the summer. But today, Psalm 37. And it's one of my favorites. I hope it becomes one of your favorites. And it's helped a lot of believers. It's helped me as well. It's helped a lot of believers get through difficult times, especially when maybe enemies oppressive difficulties, uh, people coming against you and having to respond to that. And of course, this is a Psalm of David. We go to our chart of authorship and sure enough, it is mentioned that David wrote the Psalm, Psalm 37. Uh, by the way, uh, David steps into the Psalm, as you'll see, uh, as, as, a, as a man who says, I have seen I have seen, I have seen, David says. So he speaks of his own account of what he's experienced in his life. And he says, I've been young and I've been old. So it's something that David wrote maybe a little later in his life. And, and, and looking back at his experience as a man, as a godly man and his sufferings. And he's seen what godliness produces. And he's seen what the enemies of God do or, or what they do against godly people. And what's the answer? Because this, this a, lot, a lot sounds like... Other psalms, Psalm 73, why do the righteous suffer and the, uh, and the wicked um, prosper? Uh, psalm 49, the things of God. And why do, the, why do righteous people and good people and godly people suffer so much in this world? And so you'll see that quite a bit. Uh, David will speak of the land, you know, dwell in the land. And uh, we have to uh, really understand it from David's perspective because he's not talking about this land. He's not talking about America. He's not talking about Australia, New Zealand, or Mexico, or anything like that. He's literally talking about the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is the land of promise. It is the land which God carved out of the whole world to give to the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he gave them to the tribes and he allotted them their, their lots in, 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 their, in, in the land. But there were also enemies. The Canaanites, the Amorites, the Philistines who came into the land and wanted to get them out and wanted to threaten them with violence, threaten them to kick them out of God's land and the persecution of righteous people. David had to flee. And if you've been with us in the men's Bible studies, you know that David had to flee sometimes out of the land of Israel. Uh, we know that even Elijah, we studied Elijah a few times, he had to leave the land of Israel. And whenever you see the land and blessings and righteousness has to do with God's promise that within the land, God was going to bless his people. However, if they ever became wicked, like the other nations around them, God was going to do it himself. He was going to kick them out because it's his land. And so the vivid pictures of David, you know, the enemies of God are like trees, <laughs> They're like gonna, they're, they look like they're in power, but then they're going to be gone. They're like going to be vanishing like smoke. And, um, and by the way, the, the, this, uh, this particular psalm, particular psalm has a lot of uh, connections, of course, to Proverbs, to Job, and to Ecclesiastes, which are the portion of the Old Testament we call the writings. Uh, we call it Tanakh, Torah, Navim, Prophets, Ketuvim writings, Tanakh, T and K, Tanakh. And it has a lot of connections to it. Even though uh, we have different kinds of psalms, this psalm is a unique psalm because it carries so many different spiders into so many different books in terms of how do the righteous supposed to respond to wickedness. Do we, do we lash out in anger and become hostile to them? Do we take it? Do we simply ignore it? Well, those are things we're going to talk about today. Now, we have to look at the background. We don't know when David wrote this, but he certainly wrote it by his own admission. He's been young and he's been old, so maybe later on in his life. And he has seen the conquest of the land. He knows the conquest of the land because of Joshua. He's seen it, uh, God's blessing. He's seen God's blessings, and he sees the enemies of God coming in. And he tells the, the people that he's that is reading the psalm, and, and so are we reading the psalm. He tells us as well, as well as the Jewish people, that they needed to walk in the way of the Lord. And he uses this beautiful word, and we used it in the, when we study the Psalms early on in the spring, summertime. Maybe not summertime, it was January. 
we did Psalm 1. And we looked at this word called the way, the way. And it's this beautiful Hebrew word called Derek, Derek. Not the name Derek, but it's like Derek, Derek in Hebrew. It's this uh, idea of the way, kind of like what the, the New Testament believers call, were called the way. They weren't called Christians first. They were called the way. And it has to, be, it has to do with God's way, but it has, to, it has to do with the way you walk, the way you live. Right? It's a way of living. Your walk has to go in a way, the ways of the Lord. And so the way a person lives his or her life, Derek, the ways of the Lord, right? And David's encouragement is, are you walking in the ways of the Lord? Yes, the enemies are all around you. Yes, there's persecution and difficulties. And the enemies of God are everywhere. But remember, if you don't walk in the way of the Lord, despite the decay in society and the enemies of God, dwelling in the land, David would say, dwelling in this land, the land of Israel, depends on your moral behavior, depends on how you walk in the derrick of the Lord. That's the critical thing. You would think David as a warrior would say, we just have to pick up an arm, you know, pick up a weapon and go fight the enemy. And he certainly did that when God commanded him. But to his people, he says, you need to walk in the way of the Lord because God delights in, God, in, in the godly man's way, the way he walks. And God is attentive to the way we walk, even when we go through trials. You would think that, well, God knows I'm going through all this you know, pressure and temptation. He knows if I slip up here and there, because it's so hard. No, God says, I want you to walk in that way, especially when you're dealing with all this. So let's look at the temptation, because it is a very unusual temptation. It is not the immoral thing. It's not the lust thing. It's not the, 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 you know, grabbing all you can, and that's a big temptation, although that's very much real and present. Let's read the first few verses, one through three. Actually, I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to go to seven, just the first part, because I think it catches the whole flavor. Don't fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious toward the workers of iniquity, for they will wither quickly like the grass. And they will fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his own ways. Because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Uh, I'll just read verse 8. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Don't fret. It only yields or only leads to evil doing. So the first temptation we want to look at is fretting. Fretting. What is fretting? It's the temptation to fret. What is it? It's to be visibly worried is an anxiety, a concern, even an anger when you see things around you that are not right. And especially those who are the enemies of God. And in this psalm is because the enemies of God are winning. They seem to be winning. And the temptation of the godly man, his first temptation is to say, what's wrong with this picture? And we fret. And we become anxious and we become angry, and we become visibly worried because what the enemy is doing and what they're seemingly getting away with. And that's the first thing. We become, we fret. We become anxious and worried. What is the second one? Actually, uh, three times is mentioned here in, this, in the first uh, eight verses. Uh, verse 1, don't fret. Verse 7, don't fret. Verse 8, don't fret. So in the first three, in the first eight verses, God has already told us three times not to do something. Is it because we're hard to, is it for us hard to get? I think God is reminding us a very important lesson here. It's not just taking up words on a page. The second thing that happens is we become envious. We become envious and we can become vindictive because of the envy. Why do they have it so easy? 
why is it that people that don't care for God or the Word of God, and majority of people are like that, by the way, um, hit it home a little bit, majority of your relatives are like that. Majority of my relatives are like that. They have this philosophy. The philosophy is uh, they may not be overly wicked. They might not be violent in a sense of uh, causing harm to other people, but they have a philosophy in life, and that philosophy is called selfism. Oh, there it goes. We're back. Selfism. You know the philosophy that me first, me second, me third, you know, me, myself, and I philosophy? The idea that they're after what they want and only what benefits them they're going to do. And so because of that, they'll engage in all sorts of dishonesty, all sorts of behavior, ungodliness, because they have no regard for God. They have only one thing in mind. The ultimate loyalty is self. The ultimate loyalty is self. So they prosper because they do prosper in this world because their ultimate loyalty is to self. So they're in it for what they can get. And if you focus on your life on what you're going to get and, and how you're going to get it and you don't care about scruples or how you do it or who you step on to get it, you actually may be able to do something that is beneficial for you in terms of prosperity, especially in a country like this one. Or especially in Israel, when God was blessing Israel, many people took advantage of it. So in the secular environment, I worked there for a long time in corporate world, I've seen people that were immoral, unscrupulous, dishonest, get the promotion. And people that were godly, people that were seemingly even better for the position, get passed by. And you look at it and you can get mad. Why do these guys get it? Don't you know that guy? You know, he, he, he's doing this thing. He's sleeping with that woman or that man is doing this. And, and it's just like nobody cares. Well, because they all think the same. It goes hand in hand to what they all do. So it, it makes sense in their eyes. It doesn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to our eyes. Um, or how about a mom or a wife or, or a homemaker or somebody's home and, and, and they see another family. And they're doing all kinds of other things. And they see like, well, I, I want that for my family. They seem to be getting by pretty well. But it's ungodly and unscrupulous and dishonest. And she can become tempted to maybe behave like that because they have it so well. And their kids are getting on in life much better than our kids. Because we have to answer to a different authority. It's, it's not about self anymore. So it just seems to be that people don't care about God's word. And so those are the ones that get by in life much better than us. In fact, it seems like, the, you know, like an old euphemism, the dice are loaded, right? You, know, you ever heard that? The dice are loaded. So basically, basically, it's all gig. It's rigged. It's rigged. This life is rigged <laughs> that the godly will not prosper as much as the wicked. It's the fallen world. And it seems like that's the prompt, uh, you know, the prominence in this world is the fact that people that seek after ungodliness will prosper much better than people that don't seek after ungodliness. So, uh, you know, we see a position in, in our governments, uh, in position in schools or jobs or anything, and it seems like the ungodly take those jobs. They're the ones in leadership. They're the ones in power. And, and we look at it and go, wouldn't it be great to have a, a godly man in there? Wouldn't it be awesome to have a godly man in there? But it doesn't seem to be many godly men that would take that. So it just seems like godliness is shrinking and ungodliness is rising. And the writer of the Psalms is saying, don't you fret about it. Don't start looking around and think like, oh, oh, what's going to happen? Or don't start saying, oh, I wish I, I wish I had that. I wish I could almost maybe, maybe we become so uptight and we begin to think and begin to worry and anxious. And I don't know if you ever had those things. I surely have had them, in all honesty. And especially when bad things happen and you try to live a godly life and it just seems like everything comes against you. Is you have these thoughts like, is it worth it being a Christian? Is it worth it? Maybe I took it too far. Maybe I just have this, maybe you have this like maybe fanaticism that I, I really believe God's word. And, and maybe you shouldn't believe it that much because, hey, you know, people seem to be getting by very well in this life without obeying God's word. Maybe I should back off a little bit 
and become like everyone else, right? Because the more I want to become like Christ, the more I have setbacks. And so people have this temptation to think, is it worth it? Maybe, maybe I won't be as godly this week because maybe things will go better for me. And don't think for a moment that doesn't happen to believers. You know, that we get irritated, we get angry, and there's that temptation. Looking at the unconverted in their lives and how much they have influence in this world. And we go, man, I wish I had that kind of influence. I wish we can gather a bunch of people like the ungodly do. I wish they can get organized like the ungodly can get organized. And we can do it. And we, can, we actually can maybe make a change in this world. But it doesn't seem to happen. And so uh, it's a common temptation, and it's a common temptation in the Psalms. And that's why David wrote this. So he says in verse 1, let's go back again, do not fret. So we're going to look at three things that are the temptations of a godly man. What not to do, number one. Very simple, what not to do. It's interesting how God always, not always, but he seems to begin with what not to do first. You know, in this age of positive thinking, right, we're, t- we're told only focus on the positive. Don't tell people no, because then they'll reject you. Right? That's a common thing we hear. Don't focus on the negative. And yet, in Psalm 1, it says the godly man, you know, the man that walks with the Lord, he's not to walk with the unrighteous. Don't do something. And right away, the first thing we're told, what not to do. Second thing we're told is to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. That's a big dis- distinguishing we have to do. Because who is righteous? And who is wicked? And how do we make that determination? And the thirdly, a th- a third thing is, why should the righteous not envy the wicked? So three points, very easy. Now, don't get me wrong. It's going to take a little bit of time to go through this. But three points. Most people will turn it off now. Three points. What not to do, how to distinguish the righteous and the wicked, and why should the righteous not envy the wicked? So let's deal with the first one. Don't fret. We are forbidden. We are forbidden to fret. Did you see that? Three times. A command in the Hebrew, we are forbidden to fret. It's as, it's as much as saying, do not envy. Thou shalt not envy. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not commit adultery, right? It's as, it's as strong as that. It's like the commandment. Do not fret. It should not dominate our lives, is what, what, uh, what David is saying. Um, you should not look into what the unconverted is doing and gauge yourself alongside them. And, uh, and you don't have to, you know, especially now, we can go into social media, we can go into any website, we can go into any kinds of things, and, and you can look. <gasps> oh, and did you know what they're doing? And did you know, see what this organization is doing? Did you see what this other thing is doing? And we become so almost jealous to a point um, because their lives is so much, seems to be so much better. And uh, uh, David's saying, don't fret. Don't look at them. Don't compare yourself to the unconverted world because they have it so easy. Uh, why do they have it like that? Why do they seem so comfortable in their lives? Don't fret about it. Don't get worried about it. Don't become anxious about it because we start comparing. And the second thing he does is to distinguish, to distinguish between the wicked and the godly. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're not going to go into, but a good chapter to read would be Proverbs chapter 10. Godly versus the wicked. Godly versus the wicked. And um, this is a common misconception, is that there are more than two types of people. The psalmist only says there's two. God's word only says that there's two. That's it. Not three, not four, not five, two. Godly, wicked. Now, we like to have all kinds of shades of gray. Well, what about if it's not that wicked or not that godly? Well, that's not not what the Bible says. The Bible says um, wicked people are evildoers, workers of iniquity. The righteous are called upright, the uprightness in heart. Uh, But let's look at some of the things that the wicked people do. This is how the wicked does. Verse 12, the wicked plots against the righteous and they gnash at him with their teeth. Those who are malicious, who are against God's people, and they plan out. They plan out plots, schemes is the word, against the just. They literally scheme things against godly people. Verse 14, 
the wicked have drawn their sword and they bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy to slay those who are of upright conduct. They bring others down. Those who are living honestly, those who are living right, they tend to bring them down. Verse 21. The wicked borrow, those not repay, but the righteous is gracious and give. The wicked borrows, those not repay. They're not honorable. They're not conscious about what they're doing. They only take care of their own needs, not the needs of others. They don't really care about the needs of others. They simply only care about selfism, right? Verse 32. The wicked spies on the righteous, and they seek to kill him. Talk about spying. We talked about it earlier, right, Keith? <laughs> they spy. They like to get other people in trouble right away. They scheme, they lie, and they are anti-righteousness. They don't like people that are being right. So they look at the righteous and they become angry toward them so much more that they even gnash their teeth. They plot, they scheme, and they literally are against God's people. But the problem is not that they do that. Do you know what the problem is? They prosper. Because of what they do, they prosper. And I know already you have your hand on your hip and you're already saying like, that shouldn't be. But you know what? It is. Our, our basic reality of life tells us that this is not a, a dream that we're going through. This is a reality. The wicked, when they do this, they prosper and they remain in power. So the more they do it, they seem to be more prosperous and they become more powerful in this society. And I know what you're thinking. Well, why would God, right? Why would God let them do that? And we become the philosopher of Psalm 73, right? We become like Psalm 37. We become like Psalm 49. You're not the first one to ask those questions. Why do the righteous suffer and the ungodly don't? Why do the righteous suffer persecution and the ungodly seem to prosper in all their lives? Let's continue. Now, what does David say about the righteous? It says in verse 21, the righteous is gracious and gives. You know what uh, a person that's righteous, according to the Psalms, it's somebody who lives for God, and because they live for God, they're very gracious to other people. It's actually very kind. Now, this is not talking about salvation by works. It's talking about a converted person who has God living in them and through them, and you'll see that in a moment, and they're actually, by their good actions, take care of other people. Verse 30. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. His tongue speaks of justice. They are concerned for what is good. They're concerned for what is righteous. And because of that, they're concerned for what is godly. Right? They care about God. They care about what God says is just. They care about what God says is righteous. We already read verse 31, but, oh, we didn't. That was another one. Verse 31. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. They shall not slide. The way of the righteous is you have God's word in your heart. That, we learned that in Psalm 1, didn't we? About the righteous who meditates on God's word, who seeks after God and dwells on God's word. That would make the person righteous. Now, the New Testament, combining now the full counsel of God, says righteousness can only be achieved through faith in Jesus Christ. It's by acknowledging our sin, repenting of it, and trusting that Jesus the only true righteous one has died in our place to give us his righteousness that is given to every person through faith in Jesus. And that is given to us by faith. We become faith by righteousness, his righteousness. Whose righteousness? His, not yours. And that's a very important thing. You're not righteous apart from Christ. You can't be righteous apart from Christ. And if you, go, if you grow apart from Christ... Right? Very logical. You're no longer righteous. We have to stay connected to Christ. It's his righteousness. Now, the way the New Testament puts it, puts it in accounting terms. Anybody here worked in accounting before? Don't be shy. It's not a sin or a crime. Right? Uh, you work with ledgers. You work with debits. You worked with credits. The way the New Testament puts it is, when you came to faith in Jesus Christ and repentance of sin, your ledger had a huge negative balance of millions and millions and millions of debt. It was in the red, as they would like to say. But then Christ touched your life one time, and he gave you his righteousness. He gave you his, and your balance went from negative 
to a complete, infinite positive. But not only that, he removed the New Testament. He removed the negative and gave you the righteousness. So he did two things. He didn't just give you righteousness. He actually removed what was against you, the sin. He removes the sin and gives you his righteousness. Amen. You should all be excited about that because I wasn't very righteous, either by behavior or by action or by word or deed. But he comes into our lives and he gives us his righteousness. It's still his. And now you have to spend that money, in a sense, spend the righteousness the right way. In order for you to be righteous, you actually need to be applying that righteousness. See how the New Testament puts it? It doesn't say, okay, you have it in the bank. Great. What are you going to do with it? (laughs) I'm just not going to touch it. It seems so nice. No, the New Testament says, use it. It's the life of Christ through you. Go out into the world and spread his righteousness through his word. You know, it's kind of like if you're in debt, right, and, and, and somebody gave you a million dollars, and then the next week I said, Keith, are you, how are you doing? Oh, man, I'm still in debt. I thought you got a million dollars. I just don't want to touch it. Well, it's supposed to go toward the debt. It's supposed to clear the debt up. Well, you know, I just don't want to deal with it. And so many Christians who have come into faith look at, look at it that way. They look at righteousness and they say, oh, I got it by faith in Jesus. Okay, go and apply it. But they still live an unrighteous life. Why? Because they're not applying the righteousness that was given into their account. You have to use it in order to be righteous. Okay, is everybody clear with that? Okay, the New Testament teaching combined with the whole full counsel of God, is that righteousness comes through faith in Jesus, but it needs to be exercised in faith because it's his righteousness given to us and it needs to be applied in our life. So we have to work it out. How does a believer works it out? According to David, it says they are good to God's people. They are godly. They seek for justice. They seek for righteousness. And they have God's word in their hearts. That's what a godly man is. And by the way, because there's only two people in the Psalms, Wicked and the righteous, it falls in line with all the rest of the Bible's teachings. There's only two roads. I read that, you know, not three, not four, two roads. There's a broad one, and there's a narrow one. There's only two gates. There's a narrow gate and a broad gate. There's only two masters, by the way. Not many. You can only serve Christ or, or mammon or Satan, right? Uh, there's only two kinds of righteousness that is exercised, either the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit. You you can't have multiple things going on at once. There's only two kinds of, and there's only two destinies, by the way. The Bible says there's clearly two destinies, eternal life in heaven with Christ or eternal judgment in hell apart from Christ. There's no middle ground. There's no no, uh, shades of grades. It's clear division in the Bible. There are two kinds of destinies. There are two kinds of people. There are two kinds of roads, and there are two kinds of works. The works of the flesh are the fruit of the Spirit. People get upset about it, right? Because they say, oh, God, come on. You guys can't be that strict. Well, I didn't make it up. God said it. And because God said it, he wants us to know this. And, and so somebody might say, and maybe online or maybe here, somebody would say, well, pastor, I don't, I don't really fit into that category. Neither one of them. Uh, I'm sort of, sort of in between. I'm sort of, you know, I'm not that righteous, but I'm also not that wicked. I mean, you're making it sound like, you know, it's, it's got to be one extreme or the other. I would say at the end of the day, look closely at your life and see where it lines up. Actually, look closely at your life, look at God's word, and see where you line up. Because there are those who laugh at the things of God, who might say, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm righteous, and maybe uh, uh, I want to be righteous, but I'm not, I don't get carried away like other people do. I don't read the Bible like other people do, but I'm righteous. Um, maybe you don't persecute other Christians, but you laugh at other Christians. Oh, look at them. They're so committed. Look at what they do on a Wednesday night, right? And um, uh, maybe you don't behave like maybe killing people and violence and things like that, but you live in a very selfish way. You know, the ultimate loyalty is always going to be self. But at the end of the day, you'll never, you'll never sacrifice for the Lord. It's always going to be what you want. And, and see, now you're understanding that you may not be as righteous as you thought. And you might have more in common with the wicked that you actually think. 
And there's a lot of people like that, a lot of people in church like that, that they, 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 they would say one thing. They, they will say, I am righteous, I am a Christian. But then their lives completely mirrors that of the wicked, completely mirrors that of an unsaved, unconverted person because they live for self, they have no integrity, they live in dishonesty, they don't live for others, they don't put, them, they don't put others ahead of themselves, and they might not engage in, bi- in violence, but they're basically attitude is self loyalty to self and doing things for self at the end of the day. It's not about God and it's not about others. It's about them. And that's an important thing because look at verse 31. David says, the law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Righteous are those who order their lives in according to God's word. They line up their life by the barometer or by the compass of God's word. The wicked order their lives against God's word. The righteous put it in their hearts. And they live according to it. Don't look at what others do that don't, li- that don't line up their lives according to God's word. It's the wrong place to look. Always line up your life according to God's word. What other people do and line up their lives differently, that's none of what we're to imitate. We're to imitate what the Word of God says. Even if they prosper, and that's the the crazy thing, even if they prosper, don't line up your life in according to what other people do. Line up your life in according to God's Word. What does God's Word say? Oh, pastor, but I met these hypocrites. Oh, you know, that Jerry Falwell Jr. guy, you know, I shouldn't be a Christian because, you know what? Shame on them, for sure. But what are you going to do about what Jesus said? What are you going to do about what Jesus said? Are you following him according to his word? That's ultimately what you have to think, and that ultimately is going to keep you and make you righteous. Now, let's continue. What's the third thing he said? Well, why should the righteous not envy the wicked? What is it about the wicked's life that they seem to prosper? Why shouldn't I envy them? It's a good question, right? Because envy is a big thing. Envy is a big thing. Why should I not envy them? Well, to put it to you very lightly, yeah, you know, why shouldn't I be uptight? They have a better car. They live in a better home. They might have a better job. They might have better everything. However, why shouldn't I envy them? Look at verse 1 and 2. Don't fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious of the work, uh, workers of iniquity. What's going to happen to them? They will soon wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. They won't last. They won't last long. They seem very prominent, but they won't last long. Look at verse 9. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord will inherit the land. Evildoers will be cut off. The teaching of Jesus is that the, the humble, the meek, those who follow him will inherit the earth. This is where Jesus drew from the land, from, from uh, um, the Psalms. The earth, they will inherit the earth, not the world. The earth. The world is sentenced already. The sentence of this world is that it won't, it won't last, and it's under judgment. The system of the world, it's under judgment. The earth will be renewed, and Christ will dwell on the earth, and he will reign on the earth, and we will reign with him. Look at verse 20. But the wicked will perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the glory of the pastures, will vanish like smoke. They will vanish away. Look at verse 35. I have sinned the wicked, the wicked, a violent man, spreading himself like a native or a luxuriant tree, green tree, native soil. But they will pass away. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I looked for him, but he could not be found. They seem to be so in power, so entrenched in their lives. They seem to be so entrenched in their position and uh, in all his glory. But one day you'll look and they're gone. One day you'll look for them and they'll be no more. And uh, look at verse 38. But the transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity or their end of the wicked will be cut off. God can remove a man anytime. May remove them at the height of his glory and power. And it has happened. 
Look at Acts chapter 12. Let's go to there quickly. Acts chapter 12 of a story that it's even in Roman history. This is recorded by Josephus. This is recorded in Roman history. Uh, what happened to Herod. Now, the Bible gives us the full account. Uh, history tells us that he just got really sick and died. The Bible tells us what happened. Acts chapter 12, a very important chapter in the life of the church. They had to kill James. Peter was in prison. God intervenes. And then this happens. Verse 20. During a famine, during a terrible crisis that Paul and Barnabas came to help the, the believers in Jerusalem, type of the two witnesses in the end times. Verse 20. Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. What's going on in Tyre and Sidon today is very, very interesting. Beirut and Lebanon, lots going on there. And with one accord, they came to him, having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, and they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. So Herod had begun to control the food supply in the whole area there. And the people of Sidon and the people of Tyre had done something to upset Herod, and they had been able to get a, an interview with them, uh, a, a meeting with them, because they, they have worked with Blastus, and they came to him because their country was fed by the king's uh, country. So the food that Herod had was given to Tyre and Sidon, but he was angry with them, so uh, they needed to appease him. Verse 21, on an appointed day, Herod was putting on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum, took his seat on the judgment seat. It was like a, uh, his palace overlooking the Mediterranean Sea and, uh, and began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and he died. Fascinating, isn't it? If you read the story, you read the account in Josephus, uh, it tells us that Herod had this uh, elaborate co uh, dress that day, and uh, it was all made out of silver, shiny. And when the and if you ever seen pictures of the the way the Mediterranean comes and the sun comes and hits the Mediterranean, it glistens into the uh, area near uh, his palace up in the northern Galilee. Uh, and he was sitting on his judgment seat. He looked like a divine being. The sun was shining on his apparel made out of silver and he was just glistening and people were looking at him and he was you know giving his speech and the voice of a god and not of man and he took it upon himself and an angel came and struck him and it does say in history it says he was eaten by worms he actually died of a very very painful disease a few days later he died of a very painful disease he literally was eaten from the inside out just like what the bible says but god struck him here is Herod, powerful, the king of the area. It seemed to be he was against the church. He killed James. God, where are you, Lord? Peter's in jail. What are you going to do? The persecution has started. He's, he's began to kill the believers. He's began to imprison believers. I mean, he didn't know that Peter got away, didn't he? He got taken out of prison. He got raptured out of prison. He didn't even know what happened. He just, all of a sudden, he was outside. And then God dealt with this wicked man in an instant. It's a picture of what's going to happen in the end. There'll be persecution of believers. Some believers will be in prison. Some believers will be attacked. But there'll be a rescue. And God will deal with the Antichrist. and will destroy him in an, in, in an instant. Second Thessalonians 2 tells us that. But here's how God deals with men who try to empower, you know, they show like they were in power. They like they, you know, who would have thought Herod was going to go in? You just look at him and you go, man... It seems like 50 years, you know, 100 years. He's going to be here forever. No. It's only what God allows and the allotment that God gives him. And then God takes care of it. Be careful, kings, Psalm 2 says. <laughs> you know, kiss the sun, lest he be angry with you. Be careful how you deal with judges of the earth. Let's go back to Psalms. Let's continue. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, uh, as you turn to Psalms, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a story. This is this is an amazing parable of a man who had all these riches, right? All his, had so many riches, and he says, I'm going to build bigger barns, because he was going to retire. And he says, I'm going to build bigger barns so I can store all my things. And Jesus called him a fool. And he says, tonight 
your soul will be required of you because he never made preparations to deal with his sin and to deal with God. He always thought of himself, and that was his greatest sin, that's that he never thought about eternity. He never thought what was beyond this life. He only lived for the moment. He only lived for this life. And the Bible tells us very clear that there's a kingdom that's coming, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, and he will dwell on the earth for a thousand years, and then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. There'll be no more wickedness. There'll be no more curse. There'll be no more sin, and the former things will pass away. But the Bible says the righteous will have a permanent place. Psalm 37, back to Psalm 37. Look at verse 12. The wicked plots against the just, against the righteous, and they gnash at him with his teeth. There's a permanency of the righteous. They're not going anywhere. They realize even if the unrighteous take away the life of a righteous person, the, the permanency of the righteous is forever. They'll gnash at him with their teeth. They'll plot against the just. They'll come against him. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn their sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy. The gnashing of teeth. Why do they gnash teeth? What does the Bible tell us that? It's not the only place that tells us that. You know, in, uh, in Lamentations it says that there's a gnashing of teeth that the wicked have against the righteous. You know, the gnashing of teeth that Stephen, that, that, that Stephen's martyrdom, they gnashed at him. Their teeth were gnashing and they were cut to the quick, and they began to gnash at their, te uh, their teeth at him because of the message that Stephen was giving him. What are they gnashing at him? Because in eternity, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The permanency of the believer, but the condemnation of the wicked. Oh, they're gnashing because they're getting ready for eternity. While the righteous will have an eternal bliss and eternal glory, there'll be an eternal gnashing. That's what they gnash now. That's what they gnashed at Stephen. That's what they gnashed in the book of Lamentation. That's what they gnashed in the Psalms. And Jesus said, yeah, that's going to happen. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There'll be an eternal judgment that's coming. Look at verse 17. But the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. Oh, he's going to sustain them. Look at verse 32. The wicked spies on the righteous and they seek to kill him. The, uh, but the Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn them when he's judged. Uh, by the way, this is a, a picture. This is a, uh, an actual, like, it was ex excavated, I forget, in the 60s or 70s. Uh, it's an Assyrian pottery. And I don't know if you could see it close, but it, it's basically an enemy has been captured by the Assyrians. And he's cutting his bow because he's been a conquered enemy. And the Assyrian is there to inflict the judgment on this man who has been conquered. And so this is the idea. It was a very prominent idea in the 8th in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the century of basically the enemies being captured and having to break their bows, and then the judgment comes upon them. This is what David is saying. The wicked have bent their bows. They've tried to shoot at the righteous, but God's going to come in one day, and he is going to break their bows, and he is going to inflict the judgment upon the wicked. So the wicked, we should not envy them. There's no reason to envy the wicked or what they do, or how they live, because it's a painful experience, a painful end. Um, the wicked and the just. Look at verse 38. The transgressors will be altogether destroyed, but the end of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. You know, God's not impartial. God's not looking from heaven and going like, eh, it's too bad. The wicked are winning. Too bad for the righteous. No, actually, God gets involved. You saw it with Herod. But look at verse 13 again of Psalm 37. The Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that a day is coming. Similar to Psalm 2, the Lord laughs. God laughs at their foolishness, at their arrogance, at the fact that they overlook the fact that there is a God, at the fact that they overlook at the fact that their scheming is known by God. He knows their scheming. He knows what they're doing. And the arrogance to think that God will not do something about it. You know, that's the ultimate epitome of ungod the ungodliness. Ungodliness is not... The idea of ungodliness is not just doing sinful things. The idea of ungodliness is having no 
care for God. Not having any care that God exists or that God cares about what you do. That's how the ungodly lives. The ungodly is not an atheist. I hope you know that. An ungodly is not an atheist. An ungodly is a person who knows that there's a God, but keeps him out of his mind. And can't imagine that God actually cares about how they live. That's how the Bible defines ungodliness. And the fact that they miss the fact that one day they will give an account. That's the fullness of ungodliness. And Jude says it has crept into the church. That's what the book of Jude says. Ungodliness has crept into the church. How does ungodliness creep into the church? Do people in church don't care about God anymore? Do people in church not think that there's a, a, a day of reckoning, a day of judgment? Do people in church not care, don't know that God cares about how they live? And Jude says they have crept in unaware, subterraneously, people that have been condemned from long ago, and they have taught that the grace of God is a license to sin, and they have taught people not to worship the true and living God, and that Jesus is our only master and Lord. Oh, there's a lot about Jude I want to get into, but not tonight. What do we look forward to? What does the righteous have to look forward to? If this is what the wicked have to look forward to, what does the righteous have to look forward to? Verse 11. But the humble, the meek, they will inherit the earth. This is the third beatitude that Jesus gave us in Matthew 5. The third beatitude, that the meek will inherit the earth. On the day of resurrection, when we're all like Christ, we'll be transformed and we'll walk with Jesus. And your persecutors will no longer be there. There'll be no wickedness. There'll be nothing to trouble you or cause you grief anymore. That's what the righteous have to look forward to. There will only be godliness and holiness on the earth. You won't have to carry keys anymore. Amen to that. What does that have to do with that? What do you need keys for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep things locked. Keep bad people away from the things that you have and, and cherish, right? Yeah, in a sense, right? There'll be no more keys. There'll be no more locks. Why? Because there's going to be nothing that people are going to go after you or after your things. No staying up late, concern for your children because they haven't come home late. Yeah, because they're coming home late. No more worries about your work and if they're going to turn on you or not. Or if, you're, uh, or if they're cynical people at work or mockers at work. And all those who you have fellowship with will be delightful. Isn't that wonderful? Did you get up tomorrow and you look forward to a day where there's there'd be no, no issues, there'd be no problems, there'd be only fellowship, and the light of the Lamb will be there. And His glory will enjoy His light forever and ever, His presence into an endless age. There'll be just a bliss of righteousness and godliness. That's what the righteous looks forward to. That's what we need to look forward to. Look at verse 16. My page moved. Verse 16. Better is a little than the righteous man has. Better is little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. Verse 17. But the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the day of the blameless, and their day and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they will have abundance. They will have abundance. Oh, a famine. That's a common thing in the old days, in the ancient times. People were afraid of famines. This is before farming techniques got improved and things like that. Uh, but in the days of the Bible, in the days that the Bible was written, the ancient world feared famines. And God promised to take care of his people. The way he did Elijah, the way he did the early church. And God promised to take care of it, even in the midst of it. Or oh, a famine is coming, no doubt. Famine for the word of God? Absolutely. A famine of food? The book of Revelation says that. Verse 22. But those, for those blessed by the Lord will inherit the land, but those cursed by the Lord will be cut off. We will inherit the land. Now, to the Jew, that meant the, 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 the land itself, the, the nation of Israel, the blessings of the land. For the believer, it expands to the earth because Jesus promised that if we follow him, we will reign with them. If we suffer with them, even if it's a short time, we will reign with him. And it's a delight. Verse 23. The steps of a good man or of a man, a righteous man, are established by the Lord. And he delights in his derrick. He delights in his way. 
When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who upholds him. And you say, Pastor, I agree with everything you said, but you know what? What happens if we slip? As a righteous man, can you slip? The Bible says, yeah. In fact, a righteous man falls seven times. He rises again, but the wicked are brought down by calamity. Actually, the righteous men fall seven times. I don't know many righteous people, but even those righteous fall seven times. But you know what? The Lord comes to his rescue. The Lord delights in the righteous ways that even if he falls, even if he slips, and that does happen from time to time, who comes to the rescue? The Lord. And it says he will not condemn them. He will uphold them. The Lord will never forsake the righteous. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about living in licentiousness or in rebellion. We're talking about a man who falls, who makes mistakes, who, who's not perfect, but who's being perfected, who's living a righteous life. But because of our propensity to fall in the fallen world, there he is seven times his way. Verse 25. I have been young and I've been old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging for bread. This is the pottery from the 8th century. It's interesting. Found in Israel. It has a Hebrew writing. It says, your brother. Hebrew writing. Your brother is inscribed in there. What is that for? You know, this is how the Jewish people took care of each other. Uh, when, the, when they were hungry, they were put together a plate. And it was inscribed, your brother. That's how they took care of each other. And I think in many, many, many wonderful ways, I think that's how the early church took care of each other. And that's how the church today should be taking care of each other. Who's hungry? Who's going to take care of you? Well, of course, the Lord's going to do it. But who's going to do it? He's going to do it through your brother. That's right. Isn't that wonderful? Even Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water in his name, you'll get a prophet's reward. And here it is, a plate with the inscription, your brother. That's how the Lord's going to do it. Verse 28 for the Lord loves justice. He does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. He won't leave us. He won't even allow us. Uh, it says his descendants begging bread. He, will, uh, he may allow us to go through that, but he won't forsake us. He will not allow himself to forsake us. He will come through us. He will come to us. Verse 29. The righteous will inherit the land. Verse 37. Mark the blameless man. Uphold the righteous man. For the man of peace will have a posterity. He'll have an end. He'll have an end. The future of that man is peace. In verse 37. It's interesting. This kind of gives you an idea of the Hebrew mind. I'll give you this idea. The, the, the word posterity. Somebody have a different translation? My NASB says, that, uh, For that man of peace will have a posterity. It's literally the word for end, Universe. a future, verse 37, peace, a future of that man is peace. The word literally in the Hebrew is, has something to do with a hinder part, something behind you, something behind you. Now think how the Hebrews think and think how Americans think. In the Hebrew mind, the future is unknown because they don't know the future. Only God knows. They know that. Uh, and so their back is turned to the future because they can't know it. So it's in the, the, the future or their hinder parts. The future of that man is peace. He cannot know what that future is fully. But what he's facing is his past. Now you tell me, why does the Hebrew mind think like that? The future is behind me. It's ahead, but my back is turned to it. I can only see the past because I've experienced it. What does that do to you? Now, we're told as an American thinker, right, we think of the future is bright. We look ahead, right? And it's true. We, we have to look ahead. But we don't know what quite the future is except what God has told us. Yeah. Are you trying to glean wisdom from where you've been? Yeah. That tomorrow will be better? Yeah. Do you realize that the, one of the biggest problems in America in our school system is we forgot our past? We don't even know our history. Ask an American. You know the Bill of Rights? <laughs> We have them. <laughs> they don't even know the first one. They even, you know, all these heroes that when I used to go to school are now villains and racists and terrible men. What happened? Not that they were perfect. Nobody ever said that they were. 
But at least there was a, sem a, a semblance of righteousness and a semblance of God in what they said and how they did it. But if we forget our past, forget our history, we're bound to repeat it. As Martin Lowe Jones says, if Christians forget church history, they're bound to repeat it again. And he was absolutely right. And we've forgotten a lot of church history. And so the Hebrew mind is, I look at the past because I've experienced and I see how God has been faithful. And I don't have to worry about the future so much. Because I know he's promised to be there. And I can own it. So if you think of the future and you think of like, well, what's going to happen? What? Don't you get a little anxious about it? what's going to happen? How do I do it? You know, but if you look at what God has done in your life, you just sat there and looked at your life and what God has done. Like I was talking to Alwyn today and we were in prayer with them and he's telling us he'd been saved for a year and he's just looking back. And I remember having my first call with them and encouraging them with Blair. Oh, wonderful times, right? And, and, and so our past, we can go back and look at it and go, wasn't that wonderful what God was doing there? And look at now. He's mature. He's to be baptized. Awesome. Praise the Lord. And do we have to be concerned about the future per se? Well, no. We know that God will be there. We don't know it fully in all the details. We know what God has revealed, but we can look at the past and gain that wisdom and say, the God of the past who was there with me in those moments of hardships and difficulties, it's the same God who promised to be there tomorrow. And so my back is to the future but my eyes are toward what the Lord is doing and what he's done. And that's what it says. The future of that man is peace. The hinder part of that man is peace. God has something for him. is peace. And if you look at the world, you're going to be anxious, depressed, and all kinds of things will happen in your mind and in your heart because the Christian is to live by faith. That's the Christian view of life is faith. Those are eyes. We don't look at things as they are but we look at things as how they will be. That's the eyes of faith. You can look at the world today and go, man, and rightly so, and I gripe. What a messed up life. What a messed up world. I'm forgetting that we live in the most prosperous country in the world, but it's, you know, we gripe about it and we have difficulties. And, but faith says, you know what? It is that way, but it won't be that way. And as Paul says, we don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, that's real faith because God has revealed it to us. We know what the future holds and we look forward to it in faith that there will be no sin one day and there'll be no more wickedness, but only righteousness and Christ likeness will dwell. And that's what it is. We have the conviction of things hoped for and we have the substance of things unseen, says the book of Hebrew. We have that conviction, and we know the substance. It's faith that tells us this world is not going to be like this forever. Things are the way they are now, but they won't be. They won't be. And so we're not to envy the wicked. Why? Because we have to have compassion and to pity them. And that's what we need to announce the gospel to them so they can escape that destiny and can escape the world and make Jesus Lord and King of their lives. But how should we behave? Because that's ultimately what it is, right? We're not to envy. We're not to take action against them. We're not to be anxious. We're not to fret. But is it enough not to fret? Can I say to you, hey, Jim, don't fret. Be like, all right, thanks. All right. Or point to the future, brother. Jesus is coming. Don't worry about it. And we do that, and we ought to do that, right? Hey, don't fret. But is it enough? Because you would say, Pastor, I have to go to work tomorrow. I have to deal with this and that guy in the office and that thing or my family. You still have to live here. You have the hope, and you know that we're not to fret, and you watch what's going on in the world, and you wish things were different, but what would you have to do? What do you have to do here? What to do? And this is the end chapter, uh, verse 3 of chapter 37. Trust in the Lord. And don't just trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. Cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He will do it. And he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Delight, commit, 
rest, wait. The psalmist says, depart from evil and do good. Wait on the Lord. This is exactly what Proverbs 3, 5 says, which a great brother in the Lord says, this is what I live by, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Commit your way to him and he will direct your path. Cultivate to pasture. You ever done some gardening? (laughs) Cultivate it. The word commit is to literally roll your way onto it. Just roll your way onto the Lord's way. Uh, Verse 8, cease from anger, forsake wrath. Another thing we have to do is stop being angry. Stop being angry. Resign yourself from anger. Avoid malice, avoid anger. Why? It won't do you good. It won't do you good. It only causes harm. Remember what Paul said? Don't repay evil with evil. People can become so despondent of what's happening in the world, they will repay back with evil. They will get angry. They will come vile. They will actually could even defile themselves with bitterness, the book of Hebrews says. Verse 27, depart from evil, do good. Verse 34, wait on the Lord. Keep his derrick. Keep his way. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you'll see it. You know, and I can preach to you, I can preach to you, I can preach to you. And you can say, what was those six points again? What was it, those five points again? So I bowled it down very easily because I, how, how, I know how I am. You know, I have a one-string banjo brain. I just need something simple. Keep it simple, right? Two things. What should I do? Number one, be convinced about your godliness. What does that mean? It means... Be decided and be convinced about who you're following. Uh, You know that wickedness will perish. You know that God is not going to forsake us. You don't have to be ashamed to be a Christian. So be decidedly open about who you follow. Be unashamedly open about that you belong to Christ. Uh, Is it clear to people that know you who you are? And who you belong to. Do people know that? Uh, Are you one of the ones that don't live their lives according to the me first mentality? Right? It's God's word in your heart. Right? Be decided about it. Be openly, unashamedly decided that I am going to follow godliness. I'm going to depart from evil. I'm going to trust the Lord and I'm going to keep his way. And as a Christian, by God's grace, you'll have been given that power by the Holy Spirit to do that. All it takes is you be convinced that that is the truth. Be deliberately, be deliberate about your relationship with God. Be obvious about it. Well, how do you be obvious about it? We'll talk about that in a moment. Be deliberate. How are you deliberate about it? Unashamedly, that you're finished with ungodliness. I'm done with ungodliness. I'm done with thinking an ungodly way. I'm done with thinking selfishly. I'm done with thinking the way the world does. I'm on the Lord's side. I grab a hold of his word, and he'll give me the courage and the faith to be determined in my faith. There's no time to mess around or wait around. That line has been drawn in the sand by by the wickedness of this world. But number two, cultivate a relationship with God, your fellowship with him. So many times... The psalmist says, cultivate, cultivate. Verse 3, cultivate faithfulness. Past your faithfulness. Um, How do we do that? Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. To bring your desire in line with God's will. If you fill your life with Christ, and your vision of life is Jesus Christ, you will have what you want. If you fill your life with Christ and your vision is Jesus Christ, you will have what you want. Of course, if you don't fill your vision with Christ, then what you want when you don't fill your vision with Christ and what you want when you are filled with Christ are two different things. And people say, well, I'm just going to fill my life with Christ so I can get what I want. That's not how it works. That's not what it's saying. 
My friend, dear brothers and sisters, fill your life with Christ. Fill your vision with Christ. Fill your mind with the things of Christ. And you will be amazed at what you want. Seriously, you will be amazed at what you want. And I, and I challenge you because God will give you that desire in your heart. He'll give you what you want once you're filled with Christ. There's an amazing thing that God has for us when we fill our lives with Christ. The things we want are things that we are surprised ourselves. <laughs> Who would ever thought that I would want to teach the Bible? And I love it. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Backtrack 20 some years ago, the last place that we found would be a church. But yet, I delight myself in the Lord, and, and, and I, I don't want to do anything else. How do you, how do you change that? How do you, how do you deal with that? Or wanting to tell people about Jesus, or helping people grow in Christ, or desire godliness and righteousness, or the mission field, or tell people about, or, or just, you're so filled with Christ, you just weep for your family. And you're like, I, I don't even like them. I don't even like them. I don't even know why I want to tell them, but I do. You'll be surprised at what God does in your life if you, if you delight in him, if you fill your life with them. There's no telling out what you're going to want, and you're going to be like, I can't believe I want that. I can't believe I want that. And it's good. He will give you the desires of your heart. But you know what the other problem is? is discontentment. Discontentment. And it's everywhere in the church, by the way. It's the result of a poor relationship with Christ. Discontent with your wife, discontent with your husband, discontent with your church, discontent with the friends, dissatisfaction all over is a result of bad communion with Christ. Unrest, frustration, impatience is really the result of a lack of relationship with the Lord, a deep, meaningful relationship with the Lord. So delight in him. So you wouldn't have a discontentment. Because if you're discontent in the Lord, guess what? You're going to be discontent with everyone. And that's where discontentment comes from. The fact that you're not content in Christ. And when you're truly delighted in the Lord, you know, you won't fret. You won't envy. And, um, and he'll order your steps of your life. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He will do it. Put your life in his hands. Let him do it. Don't plot. Just trust them. Don't plot what you're going to do, right? Uh, don't pay attention to what the uh, ungodly have. Commit your way to the Lord. Let him decide for you. You know, it's like we were telling Alwyn about his baptism. They were telling him, you should sing that song. I have decided to follow Jesus, right? That's the, that's the anthem of the church. I have decided to follow Jesus. Go home and sing that song to the Lord. Truly do. Go home and sing to the Lord a worship song that comes out of a grateful and committed heart. And you'll see how it changes you. And you would say, well, pastor, I'm not in heaven yet. What should I be doing before I get there? Very simply, the psalmist tells you, you don't have to make it up. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. He's coming. But just rest. The word rest is to just be still. You don't have to be fretting and anxious and angry and envying, rest in him. Resign yourself from the world and commit yourself to the Lord. And he will bring the righteousness out, uh, from you. He will bring forth your righteousness. And you know what? In eternity, you'll be glad you didn't live like the wicked. In eternity, you will be so glad you did not live in a wicked way. So why do you envy him now? But that's the temptation of a godly man, to look at the world and envy it because they have it so easy. Or fret because there's so much in power and they have so much and we have maybe very little. Don't fret. It only causes harm. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for tonight. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your holy word. And we ask in faith, believing that you will do this in us through Jesus, our Lord. Amen.